Welcome back to the worst of 2022, where it is our mission to find out what is the best and worst publisher of the year that has uh, that has went by. And today it's Square Enix, which is actually going to be interesting. Versus most of the publishers, they uh, they have released a lot of games. Yeah, they released uh, 20 games in 12 months, and all of them are fine. Yes, good somewhat. they are all fantastic. <laughs> Starting with Chocobo GP. Oh Which, uh, let's see, what's it had? Well, um, no more support. Mm -hmm. So it's start. pretty much over as a game. It had uh, monetization from the mobile version that made it in to the real version, which was pretty brutal. Yeah. It was also a reasonably okay game in terms of having the, uh, having, I guess, the skeleton of what could be a decent competitor gameplay-wise to Mario Kart. It's just that the publishing side and the management side decided to come in and go yeah but everything else about it's wrong and sort of stop me if you've heard that before where game devs make a pretty good game and then monetization is what really takes the piss out of it or the fact that it's like mobile first and then move to switch later and you see oh well you could imagine what would have happened if they made this 10 years ago it would have been wonderful it would have been on like the 3ds and it would have been incredible but now square enix are square enixing it up as always yeah it's it's that thing where like i you know, you maybe hear some of what their management talks about and you start to kind of wonder about them. Mm -hmm. And to continue with releases, Life is Strange Remastered Collection, which you would have thought would be a pretty clear win from Deck Nine Games, but instead it ended up with a 27% recommendation. Overall, one of its issues is just a whole bunch of graphical uh, problems and bugs. The goal was essentially to bring all of them up to the uh, like graphical standard, um, you know, of like the, the newer games. Seemingly just could have been a lot better yeah you'd wonder why you would let that happen when you could just you know because obviously a couple of graphical issues and bugs is where you go oh okay delay it delay it and fix them and then we'll have a win but apparently with everyone on there they said nah just just sell it it's fine then next we've got voice of cards the forsaken maiden which uh i don't really think anybody really heard of or noticed which in a way is weird because that is a series from yoko taro the voice of cards is just him being handed, like, not a blank check because then he'd make something big and insane, but the kind of, you can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't cost too much money. And just went and did, like, three games of voice of cards in, like, two or three years or so and went, yeah, sweet. And everyone's like, everyone who's played them because they like your guitar and they like that kind of work is like, this is a good card-based RPG. Mm. This, this is actually very nice. But it didn't have the, like, wide appeal. Also, marketing was a wee bit kind of weak and you can tell from voice of cards is a pretty may title overall so it is just them like it's small pockets of quality creatives at square enix be able to do good work but then not being able to like as a whole complete unit bring that into success seemingly that's yeah. largely how yeah, it goes so far they're an odd bunch uh yeah. now i think an easy win ff6 pixel remaster yeah the final yeah. fantasy games are very good so Pixel Remaster and the Pixel Remasters, they started off with a little bit of a uh, couple of issues and a couple of mm, sort of problems, especially ones that happened to, like in games. I can't remember specifically. I think it was, was it either two or four. I think it was two. Had some like really weird, the numbers in this game are just wrong balance issues, which shouldn't happen in a true to life remaster. But generally, as far as a, as far as a release goes, those are big. Those, those are, those are big. Those are working. Those are fine. They're close enough. Unless you're like really specific about old versions. They are like the definitive way to play the Final Fantasy series. Hey, Babylon's Fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they, I mean, it did awfully. It reviewed poorly. They said they would support the game. They have since pulled support from the game, meaning that Square Enix's uh, live service made by Platinum is dead in the water. In a way, it surprises nobody. Yeah, well, I don't think it's literally dead just yet, but it's going down very soon. Yeah. I think that's just the case of, uh, like, same with Truck with GP. They just, they had maybe something there, and maybe if they'd pulled the developers through and sort of give them more time and give them, like, I guess, more freedom to make whatever they wanted, it would have been fine. But Platinum Games are known for sometimes dropping the ball in ways that you don't expect. They are very, like, they're the, probably one of the most hit and miss studios there are in terms of quality games. And Babylon's Fall had no... Because obviously they've, they've, they're obviously known for their combat. That's what they're known for. But there's like an element to their games that uh, goes beyond that when you're playing Wonderful 101 or you're playing Melga Rising or, you know, Bayonetta or Astro Chain. You go, oh, there's like a, there's an element of creativity here that makes it shine. And whatever happened here, Platinum didn't let that in that game. I know there's people saying, well, it was Square Enix's fault. 
but I think there's people generally mixed saying, oh, well, it's Square Enix's fault. And then people going, no, Platinum in every interview before this game came out were like, oh, this is like, this was like our idea. This was definitely 100% us. We're super proud of this. And like, no, no, which is just another, hey, here, we'll make a live service and monetize it. Oh, it's dead in less than a year. Whoops. Yeah, Platinum are weird. Uh, speaking of weird, we've got Stranger of Paradise, Final Fantasy Origin, which, uh, yeah, Team Ninja delivering a, a very Team Ninja game. Uh, definitely more for fans, but I think for what it is, went down surprisingly well. So, Hard to get a an overall beat on that. So I could talk about this for a while. I'll yeah. try not to. <laughs> it's a very good game. It's a very, very well put together game that has the fantasy of like the, hey, here's Team Ninja's kind of combat. Here's that combat with the freedom and I guess the the customization of the Final Fantasy job system. It was, I guess the way I put it is, you know the whole, you know, they understood the assignment meme or like the, the turn of phrase? Team Ninja definitely did that. And the creative side of it with the story and the writing is also way, it's a little bit amateurish at times and you can tell the structure of the game doesn't super help for like telling a really, uh, I guess a normal standard JRPG story. But they, they understood the assignment there as well. And in the same way that FF7's remake is kind of playing with the meta narrative of Final Fantasy VII as a universe as a game, and like based on the success and all, they're doing that, they did that in Stranger Paradise, where like, it's very meta, it's very talking about Final Fantasy from a different perspective, and trying to call some things into question, and I guess uh, cast a different light on a really simple narrative from back in the day, and it does that really well, but a lot of the memes about how they market it at the beginning kind of overshadow that a little bit, but for a lot of people, it's also, again, again, and this is the thing that, that happens, like we can see with Square Enix, the creatives who made that, very, very good at their job. But the marketing was a bit kind of, sometimes it's strong, sometimes a bit lackadaisical. But it's like, whenever the marketing was strong, you could tell it was individual elements, individual people doing things. It's like the, is it Duncan Heaney? I think that's the name. Uh, I think he's the lead communications or content person for their like website and stuff. And they were doing a series of best classes or best characters of each class in Final Fantasy. And they just had this thing where every time they'd post one, they would have Jack from Stranger Paradise because he is, because he can, he can multi-class. So just had him with the same picture of him with like the fist up every time. And that was like really smart, like kind of small internal guerrilla marketing. But you could tell that wasn't an organizational plan. That was just someone having fun. And it seems every time there's organizational plans, they drop the ball. And even then, Stranger Paradise has an interesting part where it's... And some of this is, like, evident in Team Ninja's older games. So it's not just a Babylon's Fall-like situation of, this is, was this supposed to be live service the whole time kind of vibe? But it does have basically infinitely scaling difficulty and gear drops that go up every time you do the same mission again at higher, higher difficulties. So you could see... In an alternate timeline, Stranger Paradise could have been a live service oh, thing. Oh, God. <laughs> especially when you see how their season pass and their DLC worked into it. But they, if that ever was the plan, they steered away from it quick enough, so it is actually pretty... It's a pretty good game. It's just, again, it, like everything else, it's kind of for fans. And if you're not a diehard fan of Square Enix games or Final Fantasy, you're going to have to really take a risk in jumping into it. Which is a, not a problem when you've got a Final Fantasy audience of hundreds of millions. But it's still like, as far as strategies for getting newer and wider players in, Square Enix needs something. Yeah, to kind of rocket through the rest. So Chrono Cross, uh, the Radical Dreamers edition remaster. So, you know, overall, yeah, yeah whatever. People, just people just fine. Like, yep. Yeah. It's not, uh, yeah, it's, it had yeah. some issues, uh, right? Frame rate backgrounds. Uh, Centennial case, a Shishima story, again, came out <laughs> more of a niche thing. Power Wash Simulator, which I don't think we need to talk about that much, no, but obviously a humongous one from, uh, yeah, humongous one from Square Enix Collective. Mm -hmm. We've got Live Alive, which is just uh, resurrecting a, a Super Famicom title, as you do on the Switch. Because it was never out in the West, so, they got it, so this was its first Western release, and everyone went, hell yeah, this is a good-ass game. Sure, it's old as hell, it's from 94, but it... I mean, anyone who goes back and plays like RPGs and then go, oh yeah, these were like these were better back then than they are now, to be honest. Square Enix have an issue, right? Where they have a lot of they can they seem to struggle making new games. But there's only really one thing so far that actually jumps out of that and goes, Oh, they can do new things. Because obviously there's the contrast of Live a Life and the contrast of Tactics Ogre Reborn and the Chrono Cross Remaster. And Tactics Ogre Reborn was that's a old ass game, fantastic game. They did modernize it fairly well for people. 
and then there's like there's crisis core reunion okay that's an old game that they're bringing back and remastering there's a lot of reliance on the past but then triangle strategy came out and that yes. was them going that was them giving a pretty small team a directive of hey making you making you like creative tactics game tactics game don't just don't just copy the formula and call it a day actually innovate a little bit and they did using the kind of like the 2d hd stuff that was um, octopath kind of heavy and getting that vibe down right and that might be like their biggest success although it didn't review that much that like much on pc because i guess it was like overpriced and stuff but in terms of their success like on switch that's like one of the things that they did really right the whole year but almost everything else is either just small little uh, projects that never really went anywhere, but yeah, are like more voice pretty of cards. fine. Yeah, more voice of cards. There's Various Daylife, which was the Apple Arcade port. And like, okay, that's fine. No one really particularly cares. There's Dalefield Chronicle, which was one of their attempts at making something new. And it's kind of not going very well. Then there's like Valkyrie Elysium, Star Ocean, and Harvestella. Valkyrie Elysium, people are like, we're happy to get a new Valkyrie game, but it's not really what we kind of expected. It's not as good as we'd have liked. Star Ocean, everyone's going, Eh, it's star ocean if you like star ocean you'll like it that's all anyone has to say about it it's happy to have like that ip back but it's just about fine harvestella is here's a final fantasy farming game not literally final fantasy and i i love it to pieces in so many ways i think it's a fantastically made game but they missed like the marketing they missed explaining what the game was the game itself didn't show its best foot forward so you have all these things of like loads of really good and interesting creative working on but as a whole Square Enix are just going, they're, they're throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks. Yeah. And a lot and of the time, whatever sticks, they, they, I guess I would say they're throwing shit at the wall to see what sticks and they're not even watching. They're just throwing it and then turning yeah, away that, and that's walking away. Weird. Like when you look at the, like say critic recommendation rates. Yeah. Not great overall. But I, I guess that's the thing. They're not, they're not really making games for a general audience below a certain, uh, a certain level of scale. No. I guess that's basically it. And in a way, that is really good. Those niche audiences, like, get served. I mean, yes, with games that not really a hell of a lot really other people play. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a weird strategy. It's a weird strategy, but I think it's one that's going to largely work for them. But this only looks fairly bad because their tent poles aren't here. Yeah. That's the I, thing that's interesting because I, I think, like, people weren't maybe super happy. But I imagine they gave them money for the things and we're, we're happy enough. It's like Harvestella. Well, I think that game is fantastic. It's like, I don't care. I'd love other people to play it. But it's like, it made me very happy as someone who likes the entire vibe the Square Enix give off. There's a lot of these games in this list that I haven't gotten around to playing. But even though they're not great, I have faith in the in how I usually engage with Square Enix's games and how they generally lead their management. In the, I would say in the up excluding all of the times they completely mess up with like monetization or trying to get more money out whenever they're just making games they have what i consider the opposite to the ubisoft problem because we talk about ubisoft and go they don't know how to make a game they don't give a shit about square enix don't know how to make a game that loads of people give a shit about but they can get people they can basically like laser point their creative teams onto games that people will want to play and will remember and enjoy even if they're not great there's just enough to them that will go oh yeah this is perfectly fine. And they're kind of missing a little bit uh, sometimes overall, but it's, I think it's Square Enix are good at making games for Square Enix game fans. And that's maybe a long-term problem, but there's enough of them now that it's kind of okay. Well, yeah, as long as they don't continue taking the L's that they do, because they take enough L's that I think people are rightly starting to go, you have to, you literally just have to do better with your monetization because it's driving people away. Well, that, that's, I think, it outside of the major temples. Yeah. I think the, yeah major like humongous budget temples are, are, are well essentially this year's slate and next year's make a hell of a lot more sense when you realize uh ff16 2023 forespoken 2022 mm. but forespoken was of course delayed into 2023 which does actually mean that 2023 will be a pretty damn humongous year for them it's going to be unbelievable it's going to be unbelievable for literally almost just for the uh the appearance of first book which we'll probably not going to do it'll do uh this sold under expectations and then they'll blame the fact it was like a uh, collaboration between western and eastern uh devs and writers and that'll be fair but from what i played of the demo it seems a wee bit too ubisofty in that it's very open world very go to the uh, magic towers and just and reveal more of the map but it seems like a game that people will be happy to play and the combat is good right so it is it's, actually it's, good it's not at least at the part I played, 
but you can very much say, oh, this is a very good wide open combat toolbox. If you don't make mistakes, people will love this game. It may be memed on for a variety of reasons, including the writing and the f what it looks like, but it is a good game. It just won't sell very well. But then FF16 will come and everyone go Square Enix are back in a way that no one ever expected. No one ever could have believed Final Fantasy would sell like this again. And obviously to be to be a bit reductive, it's because they've went, here's here FF14 team, make Game of Thrones Final Fantasy. And they <laughs> went, that's what, we've be that's what we've been doing since like the 90s. It'll just be Yoshi B standing there going, oh yeah, Ivalice, yeah, Tactics Ogre. Okay, we can do this. We can, we can do fantasy with an edge in a way that people really like today. And it's going to be it's going to be big. Yeah. I I guess on that like the major success that's um that's carried them the most profitable Literally final carried. fantasy. Yeah, the most profitable game in that entire franchise uh, FF14. Probably not worth going mega into the weeds, but it it's basically the usual and Walker pretty damn brilliant. I think for some people maybe a, like a smidge behind um shadowbringers but like still extremely high yeah. uh yeah essentially yeah i mean awesome and then when the patch <laughs> content uh rolls out like their patch content has been really good not without issues not without issues uh i know samurai i've, I've the, had a few yeah. problems but even like thinking about like how they've revitalized their pvp now in fairness i don't know if that's died to death since but at least in and around the launch like what they had done with PVP was so goddamn impressive. It seems like all the content that's came out has basically been great. There have been like a few little dramas I know surrounding like rewards and that kind of thing. But overall, super, super solid. They've been entrenched problems, not been yeah. wider problems. That game is doing so obscenely well. And you look at why, and I guess we should maybe just briefly talk about it because we talk about production stuff and like other companies and how they seem to have issues. Where we talk about like you know, Ubisoft Creative Management, EA kind of handing it over to Vince because they have that problem and uh, Laura to sort that out. And then Activision having just being the Call of Duty uh, people and that's about it. With the FF14, it's like, it's just, they have a director who's also heavy on production and they have the actual production nailed. They have the pipeline for staff to get in, get their ideas in, improve, be creative. They basically nailed game development. Because a lot of, I think, Square Enix's past successes have been almost, no, I don't want to say luck, because that like, discredits it a lot. But a lot of it is, these games are really good, but they're not perfect. These games are really creatively interesting. These games really resonate with people, but they're not maybe perfect products. Because they took 400 million years to make or you know so someone's been stupid at some point in the pipeline with ff14 it is just it is as close to perfect as you can almost have it where it's just here is the team we have a schedule we keep that schedule we have content that we make all the time a la destiny 2 seasonal nature but we also know that every we, we will put time in the schedule for us to branch out of that to bring new things to the table and that's basically they have they are having their cake and eating it because well, and to, to of, because continually remaster that, yeah. like to continually remaster their own game. Yeah, but it's because they have they have nailed the process in every way. And if that can spread to other parts of Scornix, which is gonna be hard because there's only one UCP, and to train someone to be that particular about production is gonna take a while. Well if the success and he's not is actually doing that, but yeah. Like if the success is replicated into FF sixteen. Yeah, because the same staff, but yeah. Yeah. yeah, it'll be that's because I, I think I've talked about this in the last couple episodes. Triple A industry and publishers don't seem to know how to make games very well. They're, they're taking a good stab at it, but they're not actually doing it perfectly. And that's why we constantly have games that like flop massively, games that launch with loads of bugs, games that like are delayed consistently. And obviously 16 was delayed and first book is delayed. So this isn't this isn't a problem they're not facing. The goal should be learning how to make games, not trying to make games and failing and then going, oh, shit, we're out of money. Uh, I think Square Enix is the only one, and there's only a small pocket of them actually doing that. It's yeah, because like FF13, messy. Messy, messy, uh, messy. That whole series, messy. FF14, humongous disaster on launch. Indeed. Um, FF15, I think history does not look upon it particularly <sighs> kindly. Like that was like to describe 15 as a nightmare is putting it really lightly. Yeah. I don't. I don't know how. I'm, uh, like, well, actually, I, I have a good idea what the age of our audience is. You remember Final Fantasy 13 versus showing up in the alongside the Final Fantasy 13 trailer. <laughs> you remember like the the constant articles about it in the PlayStation magazines back in like the mid 2000s that game took like that was the, 
all basically almost an entire like console generation late. So insane. It was that bad. And then it was a different game. And then the director was booted off it because they couldn't finish it with the DLC. And then they basically had to remake half the game to make it better via DLC and constant updates. Yeah, like it's it's totally mad without I mean, yeah, without like FF fourteen, they're like from the Japanese side with their really big expensive tentpole games, they'd be looking really quite bad. Square Enix would be looking very bad without like there's there are two Okay, I'll say three because I think Yoko Taro without Yosuke Saito would have been pointless. Uh, for those who don't know, Yoko Taro being the creative director behind uh, Nier and Nier Automata, but he has the Square Enix producer, Yosuke Saito. They're basically like a, uh, what's it called? The Tsukomi and Bokeh pair, the duo comedy in Japan, where Yoko Taro is an absolute nutcase, but Yosuke Saito is like the producer going, all right, all right, I'll, I'll keep a leash on and make sure it doesn't go too out of whack. And those two going to do Nier Automata together and then getting the Nier replicant uh, version 1.21 whatever it was set up then going off to voice of cards then near, near reincarnation they're like a power duo that are carrying so much of like the creative side and the goodwill on that side and then you look at Yoshi P doing the same for the FF14 side and the FF16 side and you can see it. maybe it's maybe Square Enix are, despi- are uh, succeeding despite all of their organizational failure because there's just a couple of powerhouses holding it up yeah and I think on that we need to go to the news yeah. where it's been chaos so NFTs right uh, Matsuda has consistently been talking up uh, blockchain tech, Web3, um, NFTs uh, specifically. This has it long <laughs> been annoying to people. It's prompted Yoshi P having to kind of issue a firm no on that stuff coming to FF14. Fun things that we've had include a digital plus edition of a cloud statue that would allow the owner to exchange tickets to redeem a digital certificate of authenticity and a digital version of the figure that can be enjoyed on uh, on PC and smartphone in the form of uh, NFT supported by the engine platform. Uh, then, of course, in September, we had them, as well as a bunch of other companies like Ubisoft, uh, signing on to become a validator on Oasis, which is a gaming blockchain. Uh, of course, recently we've we've seen Matsuda uh, talk up their continued investment in this space, uh, much to uh, much to the disappointment of many, I would say, who probably hoped that uh, you know, like the crypto winter, uh, all the SBF drama, that that would have kind of cooled them down in that. But uh, it does seem that, like with regulation being, I think, comparatively decent in Japan they overall see it as something that could stabilize and then become a future growth area, and they want to be poised to uh, exploit that. Now, other problems, uh, Symbiogenesis, which was very much teasing a uh, you know a return to uh, to Parasite Eve. People were really excited because of Live Alive and Tactics Ogre, but it actually turned out it was just an NFT collectible uh, art project thing where the art could be used as a part of a mystery game or a social media profile yeah. picture. How exciting. So. There are things that um, the YouTube platform doesn't like people to say. So I cannot say anything that I want to say about this project, about Symbiogenesis, about the people who decided to greenlight it, because this video would be immediately demonetized and probably channels destroyed. Wow. That's, how, that's how I feel about this. It's not good. Yeah, it's it's very bad. Um, I mean, the very bad does continue, though. Yeah. Uh, live services, a shit show, pretty much. Mm-hmm. So... How do you even talk about the live service plan here? Because even with the Western <laughs> games, it was pretty involved. I remember, this is years ago now, but uh, Super Bunny Hop doing the investigative reporting into essentially why Hitman, this is before IO Interactive was like fully independent, just like doing their own shit. This is when they were um, kind of like, you know, in the whole Square Enix uh, side. Um, and essentially, yeah, them having big live service mandates. This is also something that was the case, I believe, for... It was either Just Cause 3 uh, or 4 uh, that really, uh, like, yes. detracted from the game. And I suppose when you have the sort of thinking that's going on here with the NFTs, you could see how they could just be like, ah, live services, they're the thing, mandate. Uh, but that has meant Chocobo GP as a live service, Babylon's Fall as a live service. We've got the uh, the, the game, apparently, that will be so groundbreaking and revolutionary that, um, oh, your, your man, yeah, Yuji Naka, decided oh, yes. to do some insider trading, which <laughs> is Final Fantasy VII, the first soldier, a battle royale, 
But, um, I mean, they just couldn't be bothered keeping this stuff alive, right? So Babylon's Fall is stopping service February of this year. Uh, first soldier launched November 2021, and it will have stopped service by January of this year, so this month. And Chocobo GP uh, launch, or post-launch support ends with Season 5 in December of 2022, and uh, th that's it. Like, they're not selling the premium currency. It obviously was just not worth it. So they really really do want this we've even seen as you pointed out earlier yeah. with stranger of paradise it looked like they could have been able to turn that into a live service loot game or yeah, something like that that's very loose conjecture yeah. because it could easily been teen ninja just going okay we want this game to be a little bit more replayable because this runtime is a little bit short but it is it was one of the first thoughts i had when i played the game i went oh did you try to babylon's fall this that wouldn't have been very good oh yeah the avengers yeah. Almost forgot about notable Square Enix cock up Marvel's Avengers. Yep. Uh, I guess what Disney's Marvel Square Enix is the Avengers. <laughs> With, uh, yeah, I guess a bunch of discount Avengers, which is unfortunately how it ended up looking, but obviously that's a, you know, that's a big failure from and a while back. And again, to call into, because obviously people, this is how old the Avengers is, is a game that people were calling it like the Anthem. <laughs> So now we're going very far back in time, but the idea of like it almost followed the anthem, where like, yeah, this is terrible, awful live service. Why do you bother making this? And then the developers gave it just enough juice towards the end, is like, hey, this actually isn't that bad. But yeah, some of the characters are like yeah, surprisingly the, fun. The individual elements are good. It's just the overall direction, which was mandated by obviously either mandated by the uh, like management or done by the creative team in an effort to preempt what the management want. Because there's always that thing of, oh, well, the management didn't tell them to make it, but they didn't tell them, tell them. They just sort of went, you know what we want, work away. And I think it's just, what a substantial waste. What a yeah. substantial waste of money and yeah. players' time. And it brings us to M&A. Yeah. And it's one of those things, you know, we talked about FF13. And I know that, like, <laughs> Lightning Returns, there's like parts of that game that a lot of people like. Yep. Um, I know that the like the follow up to FF13 was like way better than 13. 13 2 is uh, way better than 13. Yeah. Um, so like they did have some wins there. But imagine Creative Business Unit 3 doesn't exist. That's the FF14 people. And then contrast the game's output of East and West from Square Enix. It's kind of notable because they basically got rid of, uh, well, I mean, they, they did. They sold Crystal Dynamics, Square Enix Montreal, and Eidos uh, Montreal to the Embracer Group. Now, that is, I mean, basically, they're super expensive. Western stuff, gone. Now, the Avengers game, definitely a bit of a dud. Mm. Um, but, I mean, Deus Ex Human Revolution, that's, that's a great game. There's actually quite a lot of really solid stuff came from those studios, those Lara Croft games. We're all like pretty damn great. Square Enix were always being memed on for having kind of ridiculous sales expectations, which maybe could clue us into how expensive those studios ended up uh, being to run, perhaps? Uh, it's, it all comes back to me talking about uh, how no one's good at making games. That includes being efficient with them. I think there's a lot of, especially in the mid, like the late 2000s, mid 2000s, late 2000s, kind of push towards, right, we're going to get graphical fidelity up we're going to make these games massive i think there's a lot of i think square enix handed money over fist and just went yeah it's fine you just can make the money back and then they didn't get they didn't get their investment doubled like they're used to and going oh shit this didn't do what we wanted to do but also it could just be excuses it could be them just not having a clue what size it is for global audiences i think that's one of the there's yeah. there's so many so many reasons they can just they have good games that don't make enough money and just go, eh, whatever. Yeah, they, they truly are a weird bunch. I mean, weird at the guys. very least, if you like Deus Ex, uh, Embracer Group, owning, uh, like, you know, owning those studios and IPs is probably a good thing. But let's go to our 2023 incoming. So I think overall for the news then, Crazy. on M&A, it is just them kind of going, you know what, screw it. We're just going to double down on our existing Eastern operations. And in a world where Creative Business Unit 3 uh, is kind of leading the charge, that could actually be relatively successful, yeah. but still with their live services, yeah. that's just a bunch of cock ups with the NFT stuff. Um, you know, you, you do wonder what they're thinking of, but as we look to 2023 yeah. then, like it's kind of cracked in that you've got Forspoken coming out uh, pretty damn soon, actually. Even, that's the first yeah. thing. Even if that game's like reasonably mid, it's probably gonna 
burn money for them because Luminous is a very expensive shooter and that game looks brilliant. Luminous being the FF15 team. It's probably not going to make the money back, but it's going to be a, at least a pretty good game. It will be fun. I've had fun playing the demo and I didn't even expect that to be honest. Yeah. Uh, theater Rhythm Final Bar Line. Yeah. Probably game up your alley. Uh, literally, <laughs> li the Theater Rhythm games on 3DS were unbelievably good. And again, that's a small thing of this is a, you cannot get this wrong. So they won't because they have the entire weight of their IP and they're starting to learn that because this includes, instead of just Final Fantasy tracks, it also has tracks from Nier and from like the Saga games and a couple of other, a couple of other like, Final Fantasy adjacent uh, IP. Which means it's just going to be... It's going to be one of those things that... That'll sell a shit ton. And it'll sell a shit ton in Japan. It won't sell, like, millions. But it'll be a super solid, super cheap entry. Which is where they have success, usually. Oxpath Traveler 2. It's funny, I, I think Traveler 1, like, 1 was pretty damn good. At least by that, like, uh, you know, 2D. But, hey, we are going to use some of the more, like, mo you know... Some of the more modern techniques We're, to, like, make it really yeah. pop. Which it absolutely did. We're going to use an disgusting disgusting amount of depth of field, so and, depth of field. And, <laughs> and bloom and then everyone will say it looks good yeah. i think people like dr path traveler but it was very much more a in the same way that tokyo rpg factory made a bunch of like they're the i am sets the people and the other couple that i care so little about that i forget because they're just not very good they kind of lack a little bit of the soul that made the rpgs good they're kind of a little bit too constructed octopath traveler took the first one took a uh, a gimmick and the implementation of the gimmick of being able to cross all these eight people completely ruined any party dynamics. So hopefully they fixed that for two. They seem to have done that. And everyone's looking at it with, with a plum. So it feels like Square Enix can at least learn. Or at least a decent parts of the team can learn and improve. It's just can management actually do that quick enough instead of it having to take 200 years for games to get better. Yeah. Uh, right. FF16. What, what more needs to be said? I mean, all the trailers have looked pretty damn fantastic, which I mean, in a lot of cases, people are like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. It's just a trailer. But looking at the creative team, looking at the leadership, um, I mean, even thinking about the localization, we have every reason yeah. to believe that that English localization will be brilliant, and that's, may yep. even be the version to play. Yeah. So I guess uh, the way the way to describe, I think, how FF16 is going to turn out is, you know, uh, I guess because uh, I've used the analogy before of like the person who's like trying to trying to get really ripped so they're in the gym with a hoodie forever and they always wear big baggy hoodies and then eventually they take it off and you get to see what they've done. FF16 will be a little bit like that for people who aren't paying attention to 14. It'll be like oh the last Final Fantasy was 15 and that was big but a bit meh. It was Weird. a wee bit shit. The amount of grinding on how to tell literally this kind of story how to make literally this kind of game in every way that that core team has been grinding on in 14 for the past 10 years. And it's like live service games and MMOs, they're a gauntlet. You cut your teeth in there and you become good at what you do or your game dies. They have done that and now they're getting to do it in a, in a massive budget title, especially with like the DMC5 combat director on it. You go, oh, well, that combat's going to be good. If they hire that person and said, do what you do best, it will be good. And even like, just going through like some of the trailers of gameplay footage frame by frame and just being excited by how the combat mechanics look to work you're like this is brilliant even with like because one of the things that i think is overlooked a lot in games is how music can yeah. can excite people and get them into like oh that's that song's really good that track's really good i want to play this now and obviously master so again has been like the leading music on this and he's been doing such an unbelievable job at 14. It is, these might be some of the best developers in the game industry, and they're working on, a, on an infinite budget title. Yeah, it's like, that's the thing for me. I'm, with FF14, there are obvious and significant limitations yeah. that come to being an MMO, like from just being an MMO. I guess now we, we see what they do for a full game. Yeah, imagine what they're like with the limiters off, with the weights off, like. Yeah. It's, I know it's really kind of cringy, but it is just they are wearing weighted clothes a la DBZ. Like. Katsuko Danchi, Elements with Emotions and Front Mission 2. To be honest, totally outside of my radar, both yeah. Switch games, which I don't really play. Front what Mission, uh, Katsuko Danchi just seems like a little, uh, one of those cute little kind of off projects that they kind of just end up going for. And they're like, they're small, but it's a niche audience that's like, because I... Based on the name, I assume that's probably Otome-esque or in that direction. Maybe not. But that'll be just one of those things. They, they know a niche, they can fill it. Front Mission 2, that's continually reviving Front Mission. The Mecha IP that was uh, back in the day on PS1. I started playing that Front Mission Evolve on PC. I was like, that's pretty interesting. So again, that's just a case of them going back into the vault and going, what do people care about? 
And they've been doing a largely good job of going, what do people care about and why? Let's use it. As opposed to other companies that go, why do people care about this? We don't know. All we know is they like the name, so shit something out. <laughs> so they're doing a little bit better there. But yeah. yeah. And then finally, of course, FF7 Rebirth, which, uh, yeah, that'll be bloody big. Yeah. And maybe will not be in 2023. I can't, Im- I can't imagine so if 16 is launching in June. Yeah, I mean, I imagine I they'll hell, find a reason. Forspoken January, yeah. 16 June, that is, that's big games. Yeah. Yeah. So one thing you will notice, though, is compared to the just buckshot, I actually, I think buckshot is the best way is, to, yeah. uh, to describe 2022. It, you know, there's not humongous slugs there. It's just little pellets across the games industry, uh, whereas three is just, I mean, it's big slugs. They have, they have. Basically, they fired all that buckshot to provide cover in 2022 for them prepping the nuke that is FF16, more or less. Because you can imagine the headlines now of just Final Fantasy is back and how much the Square Enix like, management will like sob quietly in their death their desks reading that headline from some big Western thing because I'm sure they idolize the large Western audience. Yeah. It's crazy. Although I think there might be a lot more releases because they've been doing this weird thing of like getting releases pretty close to launch. I'm pretty close to just kind of out of nowhere. But a lot of that comes from something I've actually uh, not really talked about yet. And that is just because uh, we're talking about acquisitions. I was thinking about they do a lot of work with other teams without acquiring them because it's like a Harvest as an example. That was done by, oh, I'm heartbroken. I can't remember the name. But they also made Ender Lilies, the Metroidvania indie that I think is fantastic. So they're doing a lot of work of, hey, there's a lot of almost like small Japanese developers that are floating around, not really doing anything. And they have connections to old IP and stuff. So I think Square Enix are probably just working with them instead of acquiring them. And so there could be stuff that crops up out of the blue. Yeah, yeah. But it'll be closer to the wire when we know. That's why I'm interested in them. As, as we kind of like draw to final thoughts. Yeah. They, like they are doing a lot of things that we would like to see other publishers do. They're not afraid to make a small game. And like you look at Activision Blizzard, they are afraid to make a small game. They are afraid to do anything in a niche. We've seen all of the people like, oh no, it's billion dollar franchises only, right? So we've continually seen that even just like Activision, you know, they, especially with the success of Sekiro, you kind of thought like, come on, you guys could obviously be involved in in more projects. So I guess the thing that I do like about Square Enix is, well, they they do have like a a strong motivation of servicing their fans uh, with content. I mean, that's the thing that we we talked about. Like imagine if Square Enix owned the Warcraft IP, how many Warcraft things would you have in addition to the MMO? Just because of the way- Yeah, just, just because of the way that they do things. Um, and I, I feel like that is, in a way, lost on a lot of Western audiences because they are, um, I mean, they're, they're Japanese, uh, they're a Japanese bunch. They release a lot of stuff that is perhaps larger in their home territory. It's mm. maybe stuff that is going to be more targeted to people in the West who find themselves really liking anime, like, you know, getting involved in that culture. And I think that means that, like, for a lot of people, they're just like, oh, Square Enix, what, well, that's, um, uh, I don't think yeah. about them that much. But it's like, if imagine if Activision Blizzard just greenlit things like they did. Imagine all of the interesting little projects, or even you hear about those Call of Duty studios that have actually tried to do other things, like some sort of third-person game. Um, I continually like you. You see that in the development history of the Black Ops series, they keep on having like pretty damn ambitious plans for like what they would want to do in a campaign that always get chopped down and chopped to pieces. Mm. And you just kind of think like, okay. Maybe not everybody listening to this video wants Live Alive or Triangle Strategy or Voice of Cards yeah. or Chocobo yeah. GP or Harvestella even. Yeah, but, but like more games like Harvestella would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah, for- it's almost like a it's like an indie game from a big publisher. And that's I suppose you look is, at yeah. the EA originals and like that's pretty good. Yeah, and they're not even that closely tied to EA because I guess you know you know how I'll put it, right? Name one big Western publisher. And I'll technically, I'll technically give it to you if you say Blizzard because of Blizzard's history. Name me one large Western publisher that has a fan base for that publisher. Yeah, who, who's who, just like EA Games? Yeah. Who, who's a fan of EA Games? Who knows what an EA game is? You know, you go oh sports games and Battlefield. Okay, sure. Who's a fan of Ubisoft? They like Assassin's Creed, maybe. Maybe they like Assassin's Creed and Far Cry, but they won't go oh Ubisoft game. I'm in. But there are people who are fans of Square Enix. Because Square Enix have, despite their best efforts, 
that Square Enix have a creative direction that kind of and a, and a feel that goes through all of their games. It's like me playing Harvest L and going, oh, I can see this is Final Fantasy here. This is near here. I can see where you've taken the farming and put it in. Mm. But this is a Square Enix game. Like cultivate Every, super fans. Like even yeah. look at their, the statues, the merch. Yeah, that's like that's if, another good part. Yeah, if you, if you want to like actualize how much you like Square Enix. They will sell you a, they all sell you something. Yeah. They've and, made the thing. Yeah, and they combine all of this IP into Square Enix stuff. And then you get that way you can become a fan of them because of so much IP and it all permeates with their essence. It's to the point where there's a Square Enix cafe. There's multiple of them. And it's like one of the first things I thought of was, well, okay, well, going to a trip to Japan later, well, I'm gonna go go to the Square Enix Cafe. And that's because the publisher has fans and I'm one of them. I hate half what they do because they're clearly morons. <laughs> but they're still capable of making that creative stuff that I go, this makes this makes my life better for having played it. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of Western publishers and a lot of other Japanese publishers don't have that at their like at their heart. It's like Capcom kind of do a little bit of that as well. Where you go, oh, people are fans of Capcom because they do everything with the same kind of, it's going to be like this and it's going to be good. But you don't feel the same for anyone else. So that's where it's like Square Enix do an excellent job on that front. But they threaten that by acting substantially more like Activision Blizzard in certain ways. Yeah, like, like well, EA the, in certain ways. When you hear Matt sort of talk about like Web3. When you hear them talk about things that you go, that is anti-fan. That is anti where your success has come from. You're trying to get more money out of your fans in a way that doesn't result in direct value. Like obviously some of their merch is overpriced. But there's times where they can sell hundreds of dollar watches and jewelry because they go, hey, well, how do we get these people who like video game stuff to buy an expensive product? Well, they go and talk to Citizen to make watches and people go, is that like a $400, $500 FF14 watch? Give me that. Yes. Because I, because that's so integral to like identity as a fan and how you've enjoyed a product that it's going to be something you'll invest in and you'll feel good about it. Yeah. You know, it's, no, it's no one else can do that. Even if you like touch into like some of... I don't know, the, the world of watches. Like, yeah. uh, Omega do a collaboration with Swatch, and then people are talking about the Moon Swatch. And it, like, is that going to be something that's going to make them, like, a humongous amount of money? Actually, for that, maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but uh, even just, like, that example, like, doing it with Citizen, you know, a real watch company. Yeah. Um, th that's, like, an example of, like, yeah, you, d you didn't need to do that. You, you did that because it would be, like, really cool if one of your fans could have that. Um, and like, obviously that'll be a pretty high margin uh, product. And I'm sure that in terms of watch internals, you can get better bang for your buck elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just one of those things that's like, it's a nice to have. Yeah. It's saying like, hey, yeah, we can do a watch and people will buy it. I don't know. It's just like when I when I look at their merch efforts, they're really, really strong. And they, they seem to understand the sorts of things uh, like that they're, um, you know, that their viewers want, even like how good they are with music, which I mean, hey, like, yeah, you're Square Enix, of course, you're going to be good with music. And Look, we went to Distant Worlds. Yeah, they're so much better at it now because of that Square Enix music channel. Yeah. The fact that they have interviews with like music uh, staff from all across their organization being there translated in English for people to watch is like, they're... And I think this is because, and this is gonna, the video's gonna be a little bit longer now, but I think that's because of how they cultivate people working there. Yeah. Because I think one of the most uh, poignant examples is, well, actually, okay, two of the poignant examples. Koji Fox, the localization director for FF14 and FF16, and Yoshi P himself. The reason he went into video games was because he played Tactics Ogre, or o Ogre Battle, as it's called in Japan. And then he went and started working in video games and then made his way to Square Enix got Final Fantasy and he loves he understands that world that universe to T. Koji Fox was absolutely loved Final Fantasy absolutely loved Japanese video games from Square FF11 started localization on FF11 learned Japan went over there learned, learned Japan learned Japanese went over there started doing it and you can see the same in like the the amount of effort and like love that the people who work at the company can put in it's like they're the ones who do all the heavy lifting in the same way that people kind of go, well, where does Bioware magic come from? Where did Blizzard's effort come from? And it's from the people who are going, I, this is part of me. I really love this. I really care for this. I understand it. I know what it's like to be a fan. I will make things for people like me. I think Square Enix have cultivated that very well, almost accidentally, by being such a cultural powerhouse in the 90s, and even in the late 80s, being such a cultural powerhouse that now the, the people who are working there are the people that actually, like, know what they're doing i think that's a lot of it at least that's how it feels to me when because you can see the love and like the individual efforts it's just you look at what yeah, you like, just look at what the ceo is saying and going would this 
company work a little better if you shut up and let the creatives do the work? Maybe well, like you, you see all of that, yet you also see how they could have so easily lost that with exactly. hu- like with hubris, yep. with maybe financially unsound decisions. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you kind of like look at the like the FF thirteen situation, doing FF fourteen on like that original FF thirteen engine, I believe, yeah, uh, Crystal Tills. like all all of that like completely mad stuff which I think a lot of it did stem from them being very much like, no, we are the king of the hill. We're not going to look to the West. We're not really going to concern ourselves with these things. Yeah. Um, and and then it really bites them back pretty damn hard. So it's one of those things, like, in a way, it's it's been theirs to lose for a long time, and they've actually done a lot of the things that would cause them to lose what they've had. Mm-hmm. It's just that, yeah, they've been able to retain their IP and have some pretty damn incredible staff yeah, because that's the weird thing. They're, they're fucking morons. They are. But they have heart. Right, so after a bit of confusion and off-camera uh, discussion, I think we've now came to the conclusion that they're morons, but they have heart. Uh, which yep. might be a bit strange. We certainly don't mean that um, fully. Mm. But uh, just the idea that, like, they have actually made so many blunders that it's kind of absurd. Yet there's always been this little bit of heart within their IPs that people have always loved. And even though they have risked killing it all, like with FF13 and those like gargantuan out of touch projects, which um, I I mean, the the relationship between Japanese games companies and the West has always been really fascinating. I think looking at both Capcom and Square Enix, you you see interesting stories there of being almost misled a little bit and kind of like learning lessons, I guess, as we go forward. It's just uh, it's just going to be will we have this? like decently consistent stream of big budget successes. Um, I don't know how well Crisis Core um, has done, but like uh, original FF7 remake, super, super, super good. FF14, super, super, super good. FF16, also looking to be super good. Like that could be a string of real, real, like, I mean, sort of year defining for the industry big hits. Yeah they have the capacity for that. So overall then, as a publisher, I don't think we can really mark them down too much. Yes, they've had some issues, but even looking at like Tactics Ogre Reborn, they they are doing things that like, I mean, if you're only wanting billion dollar games, you're probably not going to bother with Tactics Ogre Reborn, no. even though like, it's great. Yep. Uh, and it's kind of like that with so many things like Harvestella, the, with the way that, that game was made, it was never going to be Animal Crossing sales. Never. Yeah. It was just wasn't going to happen. But with this mix of the larger titles and, um, I mean, those smaller games that almost feel like they're from a bygone era, purely because we're not really used to really, really big publishers making games like that, uh, because they're now all these, like, you know, franchise machines. Obviously, this is a franchise machine, but you know what I mean, right? Like, Yes. Yeah, the, they, they operate at one level as franchise machine, and then there's another level where there's clearly a little bit more play going on, a little bit more fun. Yeah. And that's where I think a lot of their good output comes from. It's from them going, is that going to make some money? Eh, let's find out. Let's see. Let's see. No harm, no foul. We already have our big stuff planned, so we'll let small stuff dance in between the cracks. And that's, I think, what the... And I see EA learning this lesson. Some of it's not quite um, fully implemented the same way because of EA Originals being feeling largely, oh, EA just handed the money and said do whatever they want, but it doesn't feel like an EA game. If they can get that a little bit more feeling in-house, and they can get Respawn to grow and continue their uh, crusade of just making video games yeah. that are great. EA, or, EA have learned this lesson the quickest. And obviously, all of the publishers have lessons to continue to learn, especially Square Enix. But I feel like there's there's the part that Square Enix have... They've got the key to doing that part right. Just need to improve quality overall. And EA are learning it. So I think we need other publishers to learn from it. So it's like I wouldn't call them by any chance the best this year, I don't think. I think that definitely goes to someone who hasn't been shilling NFTs disgustingly and hatefully and also cancelling live service after live service and wasting what otherwise could be fantastic games yeah. all, in the, all in the name of earning more money because that's how things go. But they're not the worst, that's for sure. They did Harvestella. They, I mean, Harvestella, <laughs> for as mid as that game is in a bunch of ways, it's, it's the most memorable game I played last year without a shadow of a doubt. And that's, that's saying something like, yeah, it's it. between between my last year. My, well, okay, let's say the last like twelve months, to include the December period between Endwalker and Harvestella. I'm like, no, yeah, thank, thank you, Square Enix. And my life is notably better from playing fantastic video games. Thank you, and that's what makes people fans, more or less. I think that basically says it all. Yep.
right? So it'll be interesting when we kind of try to put everybody in a tier list or something. Yeah, um, do that next week, maybe, see how it goes. I think we'll do it next week. Uh, but there you go. That's the overview of Square Enix in, uh, in 2022. I think uh, a, a mixed period with a hell of a lot to talk about. And in a way, no one really does it. I, okay, because like there's a lot of other Japanese publishers who do do similar things. Um, maybe, you know what? Maybe like there's there's some comparison at some day. Maybe the Embracer Group will have to grow a little bit for this to happen. Mm. There could be a little bit of a comparison between like them and the Embracer Group. Could be, like yeah. they're doing that Gothic remake. I don't think the Gothic remake is going to be like the humongous big next thing. But in the same way that like Harvest Outler or something comes out and like for the people that it is like targeted at, they absolutely adore it. You know, may maybe Embracer will end up in a weird way being, or at least learning some of those lessons. But yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, it's bizarre. At the very least, I know that with the ongoing support, for um, Final Fantasy XIV, which has very recently had a patch drop that I believe people are pretty damn jazzed about. Last week, full um, of fantastic content, as, yep. as always. And there's not even all the content that's not out yet. They've got another ultimate to be released soon. And it'll have it? like another two, three patches uh, this year. Yeah, and then at, uh, I think it'll be the American Fan Fest in July. We'll know what the next expansion is. And <laughs> that, like that's happening in July. Now, which, let's... which will be a month after FF 16s out. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that as you as you look forward to the rest of this year, assuming they don't talk about NFTs as much, yep. Really good PR. Extremely. Like impeccably good PR, especially if Octopath Two is a successful iteration on one. Yeah. So I actually think that they really do have it all to win. Uh, we'll do, have yeah. to see what happens, obviously, but I think 2023 is going to be a pretty bright year. 2022, mix with a lot to talk about. So that's it for today. We're almost to the close uh, of the series, so thank you to everybody who's been uh, sticking with us as we've been doing our dives into every single publisher. Um, I dread having to put all these in a tier list because, it'll honestly, be it'll... Really? I think it'll be hard. It'll be easy. Most of them sit firmly in D. Oh, that'll be it, and yeah. Then, and, then, and then Capcom sits in A+. They almost sit in S, but A+, for now. Well, you can take bets as to whether it turns out that way. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's it for us today. See you next time.